I wonder if you turn, please, to that first chapter of Galatians as our starting point. And I want to, in the few moments we've got, and I promise I won't be long, the few moments we've got together to consider the message that the chosen man, chosen by God, Paul, delivered and so changed people's minds and lives. Can we go in at chapter 1 at the beginning, please? Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man. He didn't sort of choose to do this for himself. God selected him for this purpose of spreading the gospel, really outside Judaism, to the Gentile, the non-Jewish nations. <coughs> Neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him, Jesus, not Paul, of course, from the dead. And all the brethren, the brothers, the members, which are with me, and to the churches, we would refer to Ecclesias, perhaps, of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And I want to present to you now in this and you'll pick these up in other letters of Paul three key words or ideas which are very much joined together if we go to the beginning of verse 3, the first word is grace. It's not a word we really use very often. We might talk about a person being a gracious person, but for, for many it, it won't be part of our normal working vocabulary. <coughs> and we'll come to this in a second. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and from... Now the second key idea, three words, Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins. And the three words or the ideas I want to draw your attention to are grace, Jesus Christ and gave. Because the three ideas very much describe the gospel preached by Paul and the foundation of course was the Lord Jesus Christ. Many have sort of tried to argue that in fact Paul had a different gospel, different good news to that contained in the gospels, but given another two hours we could sort of squash that one. It really wasn't, it was the same good news. And if we go back to the end of the chapter, chapter 6 and verse 18, the last verse, We read, brethren, the grace, the word again, of our Lord Jesus Christ, those words again, be with your spirit, be with you, amen, so be it. And grace is a key word in the gospel message. Just moving on, back to chapter 1 of Galatians, verse 6. Paul had written this letter because there was a major, major problem in the Galatian Ecclesias. Now, if you can imagine a, a map of Turkey, and on the sort of Greek side, the left-hand side, or for those who have a, a working knowledge of geography, the west side of Turkey, it is that sort of area, and it covers places that have been in the news for... Um, migration recently. But look at verse 6. I marvel, I'm absolutely amazed, says Paul, that ye, that you, are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ and to another gospel. Paul had preached and then he discovered that they were, they, they'd sort of taken hold of something different, another gospel. And in verse 7 he says, which is not another. There is only one gospel, and we've got it here. 
There is not another, there's not an alternative. You think, well, I'll go a different route to the same end. There isn't a different route to the same end. There's one route through the Lord Jesus Christ to the same end. The Greek word for grace it has connected with it, it's the original language, the idea of a gift. Sometimes you might have heard of it described as unmerited favour. God's favour given to people like us, men and women, ordinary men and women, which we haven't really earned. But I, I suspect that that doesn't really encompass what's happened. Because of the sinful nature of our beings from Adam onwards, we've not only not got a merit, we've sort of started at a negative point, a demerit point, but God has given a gift, his grace, and it's concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to just pick up the idea of Christ outside of Paul's writing, just for a second. To, to, I know I'm labouring the point. Acts chapter 4, verse 8. But, but if we don't grasp the importance of the Lord Jesus Christ, the rest is on a very uncertain, unsure foundation. Verse 8, Peter had been preaching and healing and he was reprimanded by the Jewish authorities. Verse 8, then Peter, not Paul, we're talking about Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said unto them, ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, you know, the establishment, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent, the man who had, was lame, he hadn't the ability to walk, by what means he is made whole, he's healed, be it known unto you all, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him, doth this man stand here before you whole. Then he does a quotation from the Old Testament. This is the stone which was set at naught, nothing of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Now look at verse 12. I haven't got any overheads or fancy pictures. I'm hopeless at things like that. But really for a subject like this, if you open your Bibles, it will be sufficient for you to see. Look at verse 12. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus, God's chosen, anointed, chosen for a purpose, is the only name whereby we might be saved from the consequences of our sinful nature, which is death, oblivion in the grave. Now, I mention this and labour it a little, I know, because we live in a world where we value, not we particularly, but the world in which we live, inclusivity. And there are many, many alternative religions. I mean, obviously, Islam is... is fairly well in the news, Hinduism, Sikhism, and we could go on and on and on. But the point Peter is making, which is picked up by Paul in his letters, is there is only one name by which mankind might know salvation, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. We won't turn to this, but... You might just remember the beginning of Luke's Gospel record, Luke of course being the same writer who uh, as um, written by the Acts of the Apostles. People's names in the Bible often signify something to do with their character, their personality, their purpose in God's order of things. And Jesus' legal father, not his biological father, his legal father was Joseph. And his mother was Mary. And the angel Gabriel, God's messenger, told Mary his name was to be Jesus. 
And now it rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? Jesus, Jesus Christ, Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth. But in actual fact, the probability is he didn't, or if he did, rarely ever heard that form of name. Because his name would be pronounced something like Yeshua, the more the Aramaic, which is a derivative of Hebrew, rather than the Jesus name. So it sounds a bit odd to us, but the significant point of this is the name meant Yah, God's personal name, shall save. God will save people through the gift, through his grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there are no two ways about that. It's, it's, it's a certain as we're gathered in this room. And this is what Paul's message was. Yash shall say, God's grace. In the Roman Empire, and Jesus was, was raised uh, on the edges, I suppose we would say, the eastern edges of the Roman Empire in Judah, in Israel, possibly you might know it as Palestine. Now, in the Jewish world, in there was lots of there were lot, a lot of changes in who was the emperor. For example, in the year 69 AD, which is about a generation after Jesus, but the time when Paul was writing his letters to these young bodies of, uh, of believers. In 69 AD, there were four four Roman emperors within the same year. I mean, mainly they got bumped off by somebody else. So a new one came. And in that year, you'll have heard of the first one probably, Nero. Two others whose names I can't remember, but if you really press me I might. And the last one, a man called Vespasian. But can you imagine, in an empire which is centred on the city of Rome, the uncertainty, oh there's a new empire, what's going to happen? Are we going to lose our livelihood? Are we going to be increased in tax? Are we going to be invaded by foreigners? So what happened was that new Roman emperors, successive ones, <coughs> sent messengers round to all the towns and cities and even what we would call villages, because cities then generally, not, not always, generally were quite small, and they would shout a word, like town criers, and they would say evangelium, from which we get the word evangelist. Um, I won't go into boring details while we pronounce it with a w, not a v. But uh, think of wine and vine, you'll see sort of a vague connection, w's and v's. These messengers went, good news, evangelium, good news, we've got a new emperor. He's the son of God. He will bring peace and salvation to the empire and the roman emperors didn't because the empire was you know little splurges of activity of uncertainty of rebellion of invasion all sorts of things they were frauds but the message paul was bringing was the true caesar the true earthly king jesus will not yet will eventually bring peace and gosh that is good news to in a world like this where there was turmoil and in a world 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 like ours where we have savagery of groups like ISIL next October sorry October 2017 18 months slightly less there's going to be a 500th anniversary of something. I'd better tell you what it was in case you can't guess. It's not that obvious. But in October, <coughs> I think it was the 31st, 1517, Martin Luther nailed on the great church door at Wittenberg what are called 95 theses. It's really 95 statements showing the error of the Catholic Church. 
any resemblance to the truth in Catholicism is, is probably quite hard to find. But what I'm telling you this story, it's quite significant really. The Pope at that time was, I think, Leo X. When I say I think, I last studied this in 1965, so memory is a bit dim, and I apologise for that. Leo X had a great court, like a king, and he had the idea of building what is now known as St Peter's in the Vatican. And he needed money for this, and they were, he was a fairly good businessman, and if you need to increase your revenue, you know, start a new product, start a new line. And the new line was selling indulgences. You're going to say, what's an indulgence? Okay. In the Catholic order of things, for some people, upon death, you didn't ascend into heaven. You see, they, they went astray fairly early on. You entered something called purgatory, which is sort of at the punishment block, where you had to suffer to purge your sins and then be accepted by God into his heaven. The mere fact that the hope is of resurrection and living upon the earth in God's kingdom was never entered into it. So the Pope, Pope Leo X, had this great sales drive on indulgences, and he gave the, the franchise to local bishops and archbishops and sometimes cardinals. And in, well, it wasn't actually in Wittenberg itself. The man authorised to collect the money was a chap called Hetzel. And he couldn't actually go into Wittenberg, where Luther lived and worked, because he'd been banned by the sort of local king, because he was a criminal. I mean, he was representative of the Catholic Church, and he was a well-known criminal. However, I pass, I pass that for what it is. And he went round with great oratory saying, your grandparents, great-grandparents, possibly are still suffering in heaven. In, sorry, in purgatory. If you cough up with money, we can get them into heaven straight away. You know, it's so <coughs> ludicrous that it's almost laughable were it not something quite serious. And these 95 theses were sort of prompted by this. And church rituals, Catholic Church was really the only church in Western Europe, church rituals counted for more than the Bible itself. And once you go on that route, error does creep in, and it always will creep into your beliefs and your doctrinal points. Can we turn please to Romans chapter 3 and verse 28? Romans 3 and 28. <coughs> now Martin Luther was appointed theology professor at the University of Wittenberg, which was a a lower tier university in what is now Germany. And his first class he had to teach to undergraduates was Paul's letter to the Romans. And upon his appointment, he had sort of a couple of months before he had to actually give his first lectures. He realised, being a good, a good Catholic, that he'd never actually read the letter to the Romans. So we thought, I'd better do something if I'm going to teach it. So he spent a lot of time thinking about it and um, came up with verse 28, which sort of stuck in a chord, struck a chord in his thinking. Verse 28 of Romans 3, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without or apart from the deeds, the works of the law. And this became known and it really was the watchword of the Reformation. Justification by faith. And it had great impact on the world because the church had taught that by its rituals, by going on a pilgrimage, by kissing the skeleton of the fourth finger of the right hand of some saint, 
you gain some sort of reward points to get you into heaven. Paul's world taught, the Jewish world taught the same thing, salvation by works. And you can see a sort of parallel there between the Jewish system at the time of Paul and the Catholic system at the time of Martin Luther. They'd taken scripture, in the Jewish case, the Old Testament, and built up a superstructure of things we should do. And again, I make the point, if you get away from scripture, you're always going to go wrong. Incidentally, perhaps I ought to mention that Martin Luther, his name was never ever Martin Luther. He came from quite a humble background and his name was actually um, Martin Luder with a D in the middle, not a TH. And he used the form of Luther because it sounded a bit posher. No, it's serious. That's what it was like. Just as, I don't know if the younger ones, does the name Martin Luther King register at all? Perhaps it doesn't with you. He was a black civil rights uh, leader in the 60s, 50s and 60s. His name, he was born and died Michael, but he called himself Martin Luther after Martin Luther King. Had Martin Luther or Michael Martin Luther gone to verse 24, he would have seen something else. I mean, he read it carefully. Verse 28, we've looked at, a man is justified by faith. Go back to verse 24. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So we've got two elements, grace and faith. Now faith is a deep held form of belief, of trust. So not just a sort of, I believe it'll be a nice day tomorrow, it's a decent weather for, you know, not a, a flimsy little surface belief, but a deep belief in Jesus Christ and salvation through him. Grace is something else. <clears throat> we, hopefully, can exhibit in our manner of life and in our thinking, faith, absolute belief and trust in God's word. It's what Paul was saying. Where does grace come in then? Look at verse, where was I, 24. Being justified freely by his grace. Not our grace. God's grace. God's gift of forgiveness dependent on our faith. Not dependent on going to pilgrimage to Bardsey Island or Canterbury Cathedral or, or Rome. Salvation is based on God's grace given to those who exhibit this quality of faith. <coughs> An absolute and utter belief and trust in scripture. In the Bible. And these two, I think we're going to have to, some of you probably mentally already have moved to Ephesians, they're joined together and they're so important in what Paul had to say. Um, if you can find Ephesians, it comes after the two longest letters, Corinthians, then we've got Galatians, which we've had read, and chapter 2 of Ephesians and verse 8. For by grace are ye saved, God's grace, through faith, your faith, and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Do you remember that the, my opening remarks? We've got grace, we've got the Lord Jesus Christ, we've got gift, the free giving joined together. Verse 9, not of works lest any man should boast. I, along with you, cannot stand 
in this meeting and boast of anything I have done for my salvation. I've, I believe it's God's word. I have been immersed, baptised. I have tried to live an honest life. But without the grace of God, this would be fruitless. It might make me a decent citizen, but it would be fruitless in terms of salvation. Not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So a life of faith is a life of, it described here as good works, of living a Christ-like life, if I can put it in a different sort of term. Can I just digress slightly and talk about the world in which Paul lived and worked, the Roman world, or we sometimes call it the Greco, the Greek stroke, Roman world. And in that world, there were three classes of people. At the top in society were Roman citizens. The middle group were people who moved into Rome and the Roman cities, market traders, people who earned their own living in that sense. And at the bottom were the slaves. And there was no real social mobility. Whatever you were born in, you were stuck in. That was it. Now, citizens had great privileges. They could vote at elections. They could go to law against their neighbour. Those in the lower two couldn't go to law. And the, perhaps the older ones are thinking about um, the letter to the Corinthians, don't take your brother to law. That would only apply to Roman citizens. Uh, you could make a will and you would not be subject to torture, to um, whipping and beating with sticks, again, which comes into um, Paul's life. The migrants, the traders coming in, they didn't have a vote. They were unable to go to law. And the other thing was that on death, their property went to the state. It went to the Roman state. It couldn't be passed on to their wives or their families, as you normally would expect. And the slaves, of course, you might imagine, they had no rights at all. No rights, they were routinely tortured. If your master in a house was guilty, say, of treason and was executed, the slaves probably would be executed as well. You suffered. And quite obviously the most extreme form of, of punishment was crucifixion. And Paul was a Jew in which there were similar rigid lay groups. But can you go back to Romans chapter 3? Romans 3, but we'll sort of just keep the thought in your mind about Roman citizens. 3 and verse 9. Romans 3 and verse 9. The Jews regarded themselves because they had a, an odd observance of the law or elements of it. What then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we have before proved both of Jews and Gentiles that they <coughs> excuse me, are all under sin. And preaching in a Jewish world, that would hit home. Because the Jews were exclusive. They'd fence themselves in. The Gentiles were the sinners. But and this is the summary, the conclusion of his argument up to this point that both Jew and a Gentile, Jews, well, perhaps, I don't know if any of us have Jewish blood, but we're certainly non-Jews in the majority here. We have all sinned in our lives. And he's making that point. There's not an exclusive group. Can you go back to Galatians? Galatians 3, please. Now, Galatians has chapter 3 has I think something like 14 mentions of the word faith 
And apart from Hebrews 11, that's the most common use in a chapter in our Bibles. But go to verse 23. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, <clears throat> shut, shut up unto the faith, which should afterwards be revealed. So for Jews, faith came after the law. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, to focus us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. <coughs> For as many of you as have been baptised into Christ have put on Christ. And then verse 28. And this would have been almost earth shattering in a society of rigid classification of social groups like in Rome, like in Jerusalem. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. <coughs> there is neither male and female. The, the authorised has nor, but actually it's a bad translation. Male and female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. The root of faith, of absolute belief, and God's grace apply whoever believes and is baptised. It doesn't apply to one racial group, one ethnic society. It doesn't apply to free people or slaves. It applies to everybody. There is only one name by which men will be saved, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul, preaching in this way, breaks through the complete boundaries of human society. And that is reflected in our ecclesial, congregational makeup. We come from different walks of life. We have professionals, we have labourers, we have carpenters, we have all sorts of people. Because salvation is not dependent on your social status who your parents were and who your grandparents. It's dependent on you exhibiting this quality of faith, of absolute belief in your life. God doesn't want us to go on a pilgrimage barefoot to Rome and back. He wants us to believe his word. And that chapter ends, and if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. I'm not going to talk about Abraham, but most of you will, will know or come across perhaps in Sunday School or Youth Circle. God made great promises regarding Abraham and a descendant, a seed, that he would inherit the earth, inherit the land. And for those who are Christ's, they are then the heirs of something. <laughs> the promises to Abraham. Can you turn back, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 15? Some years ago, I was asked to do a special effort in a Midlands town, and the brother deputed to bring the Bibles forgot. So I... I I had to use one passage for a 20 minute talk and it was verse 22 of 1 Corinthians 15. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. And that really summarises the human predicament, doesn't it? Adam death, Christ life. That's it. And what's the difference between the two groups of people? the in Christ have believed and have, as it were, been buried in baptism, which is why we always practice complete immersion, and raised to a new life in Christ. Not a sinless life, because we're the same person afterwards, 
but a life because of the relationship now with God who is our Father we can seek forgiveness if we confess our sins. Now but the default setting is we are born into Adam, we're of that nature, we'll sin, there is no forgiveness outside of Christ and we will die and your relatives will put you in the grave possibly with a few <coughs> tears and that's it. But the hope of those who have believed is in resurrection and if you think it's a bit far-fetched, Paul in 1 Corinthians is making the argument, look, over 500 witnesses to Christ's resurrection. It's not a pipe dream, it's not a fantasy, it's reality. And the promise is for those who believe, they will, like Christ, be raised and the timing when he returns from heaven to establish God's kingdom. Now, God is under no obligation to offer salvation to anybody. He has chosen, we've looked, by his inherent grace and his, his built-in goodness, he has decided those who believe and follow this up will know his salvation. And that's what Paul was saying. It's not ritual. It's not anything else. It's a life-changing faith in God's word.